to begin on an end, with Sandra taking all the brunt of things. The Senate is apparently the Sun. They actually told you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Last night. There, were, they, there are multiple conflicts this morning. And actually, um, I believe that both uh, Alice and Dick are, are going up to Montpelier today. They're, they both they both sit on Senate appropriations and they're meeting today. So, um, so we are, um, this is what we call crunch time. Um, we hope to be done in three weeks. So, um, so we have uh, one more week of, of serious committee work and then probably will, there'll be very little committee work the last two weeks that most of the action will be on the floor. Um, so we're at the point where um, where the big bills are that, that we hope to get done this year are moving. Um, you know, this is, we are in the, the first year of a biennium, so there are bills that have gone through one house, either the House or the Senate, that may not actually make it over the finish line, you know, in the next two weeks, but they'll still be alive in January, so we get another chance to, um, to take them up. Um, I thought just that I would just start out with something local. We all know um, the, um, um, the damage that was done to Bethel Mountain Road from the, from the most recent storm. And uh, on Friday, I um, presented um, a proposed amendment on the floor to, to try to, to see if we can find a way to really um, keep overweight trucks off, off our class two roads. Um, um, it was, we don't, I actually don't like floor amendments very much. I think it's, I think it's a bad way to make law. I don't think you should make law on the fly. Um, but, it, but the good news about the amendment, um, although we didn't go forward with it, was that um, the Transportation Committee spent an hour and a half with me and one of my colleagues um, as we talked about the problem. But the, one of the problems that we have right now is that truckers are using GPS to tell them where to go. Nobody, nobody uses maps anymore, so nobody knows that, you know, gee, Bethel is south of Randolph. Who, who would have thought? Um, because, because all they know is that, is that the little voice is saying, turn right here, turn left here. Um, and interestingly, um, my, my colleague, Butch Shaw, over in Pittsburgh, um, talked about the Amya plant, and apparently trucks coming out of Amya um, there's a big sign saying trucks turn here and they turn the other way because that's what their GPS is telling them to do. And what, what we have now is, is we have all these heavy, heavy semi-tractor trailers going back and forth over the mountain road. And I am absolutely convinced that that, um, that, that weakened um, the Camp Rook. Um, I, I actually drove on Camp Rook once. Uh, I won't do it again. Um, and and I, you can see the cracks along the side, and I'm told that that's when you see um, uh, uh, horizontal cracks along along the, along the the length of the road. That that is from the weight of the trucks, and so you know it was a good chance. It was a good opportunity to get the um, the attention of some of the folks in the house who live in cities and don't know what we go through here. Um, but you know, we just Bethel Mountain Road, as you recall, was totally rebuilt after Irene. So the idea that it was that it has to be rebuilt again is just is just nuts. Um, and on the Rochester side, we have the um, we had serious um, um, sliding of the hill. Um, and again, I'm told that it's the vibration of the heavy trucks that that has that has weakened that. So we're there, we're they're going to um, on the Rochester side, they're going to do a, a complete rebuild between now and November. Um, we have we have a, a, a detour um, that allows people to get up to the hollow from the village, but you guys don't have anything quite comparable on this side. And I, I it, is it? I don't even know. I mean, can people use Camp Rock now? Yeah, you the, can. You can the, go up. You, so, you so it's open to local traffic. It's, it's open to local traffic. Yeah, yeah. they need okay. to put a sign on it. So it's open. Well, and I, I heard that they had that they had a flag person last week, and that they, that they couldn't afford to keep a flag person there. Yeah. Was the yeah. big F wash out just above the village? In Rochester, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's what I yeah. Think. yeah, there's there's um, on the Rochester side there's actually a Jersey barrier all the way across. Um, you can there are about there are about four houses that are just just well basically still in the village and you can get to those driveways and then they put they put the Jersey barrier so above that right. you have to go up Brook Street and around. Um, so um, 
I, you know, we're going to have to find a way to do that. One of the things I learned last week that I didn't know is that there's such a thing as a portable uh, truck scale. I have no idea what it looks like, how big it is, where you put it, what it costs. Um, but um, you know, then the other problem, of course, is that is that my colleagues all live in in towns that have police departments, and so they say, "Well, you just get your police department to take care of this." And I will try to remind them that we don't all have police departments. So um, we have had, you know, the, my understanding from the select board is that um, in the past, when the constable stops somebody, they don't have they don't have any way to check, um, and you know, getting them driving them to the nearest truck truck scale um, is is not not viable. So we're going to have to find a way to enforce. I mean, we have weight. It's not that we don't have weight restrictions. We have laws in place. They just there is they just don't get enforced. So um, I'm going to be work. I'm going to be pushing on that. Sandy, just to say, I live on Lilliesville Brook Road, and three times two summers ago, I met tractor trailer trucks trying to turn up Windchill Road, which is a class four road. Because which say it again? Which Ridge Hill? Ridge. Okay. Yeah, and it's a class four road. It doesn't even go through anymore. But GPS has them going that way. Well, what, what's interesting is that there is such a thing as trucker GPS. Yeah. Um, apparently, it cost, according to my my friend to my friend Butch, it costs about three hundred dollars, um, and that was that was what that was what his proposal was was would do was to say trucks have to use GPS for trucks and not for passenger cars. Um, and um, the transportation committee um, was was kind of lukewarm about that. Motor vehicles hates the idea. I don't. I don't quite. I mean, I'm going to have to figure out how we get motor vehicles. And their motor vehicles is part of is part of the agency of transportation, and it's the agency of transportation that is helping us pay for all of this. So you would think that they would want to work together. So that's another that's another <laughs> another avenue that I'm going to pursue uh, because we, we need to solve it. But but he, what what Butch wanted to say was you know show us that you're using truck GPS, and if you're not, that's that's a secondary violation. Um, the transportation committee believe that maybe we don't want them using GPS at all, and we probably don't want to put that in law. So anyway, it's, it's a longer conversation. We're going to have it. That's the good news. Um, so that's one thing that, that's going on. Um, you probably saw, uh, in the, or you may have seen in the news, that the minimum wage bill, which had passed the Senate, um, I guess back well before crossover, uh, was just voted out of the House Committee, uh, House General Housing and Military Affairs on Friday. It will now go to um, House Appropriations, and I have no idea what they're going to do with it. Um, it's the um, just to the um, as it's as it's drafted right now. Uh, it calls for increases over the next five years. Um, so in January next, um, the minimum wage, right now the minimum wage is 1078. Next January it would go to 1150, then in 2021 to 1225, in 22 to 1310, in 2023 to 1405, and in 2020, January 2024 to $15. That is, that is what came out of committee. Um, one of the complications is that, of course, it applies as well to state workers and affects the state budget. So I'm not, as I said, I'm not sure what our um, appropriations committee is going to do with it. It also affects, it affects not only not only state employees, but it affects a lot of other programs that the gov that government funds, such as Medicaid payments for nurses, um, you know, visiting nurses and folks like that. So all of those all of those reimbursements. Would, would need to be increased, and that's all state money. Now, you know, I think it would be nice if people made a living wage and didn't need and didn't need to use other government services. It's it's kind of crazy to have somebody working full time and still needing food stamps and heating assistance, and and so you know, there's we, and we haven't really been able to calculate what the savings would be on the benefit side. You know, if we're paying if we're paying people more, those are those are complicated. Calculations, but um, um, our fiscal analysts have been working on that. And what about farmers? Would they have to be? Uh, my understanding is that they're exempt. I just was looking at the bill this morning. The um, uh, there's there the bill calls for two study committees. 
um, one to look at um, um, uh, agricultural workers and another to look at um, tipped wage. Uh, so the, um, the current law is that if you are if you work in a restaurant and you get at least $120 a month in tips, um, the restaurant only has to pay you half of whatever the current minimum wage is. So if, if we're at 1078, you're getting you know five dollars and change guaranteed an hour, um, and uh, and that um, that's that has opponents and proponents on both sides. Interestingly, some of the people who get tipped wages are really happy with their with, with that, and other people are not so. So th that's a longer conversation. So there's also a, a study, a proposed study, to, to look into that further. Um, there's, there's a national push to get everybody to, to, to eliminate the tipped wage and have everybody get a minimum wage. Um, so we'll see where that, where that lands. You say 120 a month tips? It, yes. If you if you get yeah, that yeah, if you yeah. get if you get that much in tips, then then you are then the then the the restaurant owner only has to pay you five dollars and change an hour. And well, you can make that two minutes. <laughs> no good. If you're bad, you match it. <laughs> it. Well, it depends on the place. I mean, in a fancy restaurant, you probably make that. You know, you might make that one night. Oh, yeah. um, I doubt. I doubt we're being here. So it's because they're good. It, they're the company paid for they want to work, they ought to get paid for them. No. You know, Versus it's being mandatory. If they are terrible, maybe they don't get burned to do it right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. for a summer. We're at or you, if you can find somebody. That's the other that problem. Right now. That's yeah. the other problem we're having right now is we have no workforce. We have zero. You know, I see. read this thing about, uh, you know, these off uh, online workforces that are going to get ten thousand dollars you know five thousand dollars a year if they work online from home or whatever we need real people working <laughs> we need people to serve your coffee to you know do dishes to mop floors that's what we need that's what we need in this thing we you know the tech people are great but we need people to service those tech people and we don't have that right now so i'd like to see the, the, the state do something about that if I had the money right now, I'd send a bus down to the goddamn border and, and load it up and sponsor people and bring them back. Well, you know, you know what's interesting? The, um, our, the economist who works with the legislature uh -huh. um, said, you know, refugees would be the answer because they, they will accept the low-wage jobs. They're hard workers. You know, and, that's, and, and it's, it's too bad that we don't have that program oh, yeah. going, going more as strongly. Long as, we, as long as we do it the way it was done, Long time ago, and meaning yeah. everybody comes in, they do the legal thing. Yeah, well, they got the area. Tag all, you know, they just to go get a bus full of people and get well, them a job. Not, I'm not saying you do that, but no, they need to be. Oh, yeah, you have to be sponsored. Yeah, yeah. American language and American law. Wait, 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 wait. American language, I'm sorry. We're the only country that's not bilingual. Well, we are because more people speak Spanish than they do English. Well, that's good. Right. In most countries, everybody speaks two languages. Um, but I, yeah. we were, he was talking very specifically about the refugee resettlement that's program, right. which where people are very carefully vetted and have sponsors. That's great. Yeah. You know, that's a that is a, a yeah. well organized program. Have you thought? Have you? Uh, I'm sorry, I could just jump in here on this, but it has. I hear you talking about a lot of things, but I don't hear anybody saying anything about what about the guy who's making fifteen twenty five an hour. So, okay. so and then yeah. these other people that haven't been there very long, or whatever, and they make it ten seventy five, and they're going to be making fifteen dollars an hour. And there's no reason for an employer to compensate this fifteen twenty five an hour guy accordingly. So that so you are talking about what is what is what is known as wage compression. Um, I you know it's, I have a different attitude about that. I, I you know I understand that the person fifteen twenty five is going to feel resentful. Um, but I had a really un unhappy experience several years ago um, with a coworker who um, was was ecstatic about the size of her raise. She thought it was plenty of money for, for what she was doing. She felt she'd been recognized for her good work, but she was mad that the person sitting next to her also got the same raise. Um, and and I, yeah, it was, so she wanted she wanted the person next to her to get less. 
and I thought that that was, um, to say uncharitable <coughs> would, be, would be one way to put it. Um, so I, I guess I'm more interested in seeing everybody, everybody have enough than I am in seeing some people worded over others. And well, I'm sorry, but I'm a, I think I'm a pretty good electrician, and I'm not going to work for what the guy who's coming to business That's right. doesn't know crap. Yeah. And he and I are going to make the same money. Right. I'm, I'm out there. I'm, I'm done. What's the incentive? I mean, exactly. What you're talking about, in my opinion, um, creates or, or uh, not creates, but fosters mediocrity. Why do I want to do better? Because he's going to get $15 an hour and he shows up. I'm getting $15 an hour and I'm working my butt off. But your argument is not with the state, it's with the employer. I mean, I, you know, I'm going to hire you. Nothing to prevent your employer from paying you more than the guy that keeps Except for the fact that the bottom line. You're saying you've got to raise the bottom line. Job. It's not the oh, there's other guys. So, so. I just came in. I'm, I, I get 15 an hour, even if I don't know crap about the job. And you've been on the job for 20 years, and, you, and you're only earning $15 an hour. You go to your employer, and you say, you're paying this guy $15 an hour. Why aren't you paying more? And he says, I don't have to. And you say, well, I'm gone. And you go somewhere else. That's always the way it's been, isn't it? Or I can't. I mean, I, you try to be exactly going to say that right now is, is that you, what ends up happening, okay, $15 an hour happens. Guess what? Your cup of coffee is now $4 instead of two. Because I have to make up for that. It's, it's cutting, that's cutting into my bottom line, Dave's bottom line. It's, it's, I understand we, have, we, we need to do this. But everything's going to follow suit. But, but the trade-off, but the trade-off is the people who can't afford to buy coffee at all may come into your shop. I mean, that's you know. So they're, they're, well, they they won't pay. They won't pay four dollars. They won't pay two dollars. They're not going to pay four dollars. I don't care. You know, you think and, about and, that. And I, and I, and it's really important to keep in mind that we're talking about something over five years. Five years. So, well, so I mean, I realize you know, I, from what I understand, Seattle did this. They, they went to fifteen dollars an hour. They started cutting people's hours. So, so, and and I would say to you that for some people that will be a good thing yeah. because it will get them home with their kids more. So, you know, it, it, is, is it a perfect world? No, um, but I think I think there is there is a big push to try to make sure that people can take care of themselves. With if somebody who's working full time should be able to pay their bills and shouldn't need government assistance. I think that's, I think for me, that's that's the bottom line here. I, um, I, have, I have a small problem with that. In fact, that I see people who are having trouble paying their bills and they are on assistance, and in her hip pocket is a thousand dollar pipe. Right. Pack of cigarettes. Well, I, I don't have, I have, I have a smartphone, but it was a hundred dollars. Well, I have, that works fine. I have none, so just, oh, just. My point being, and we're not going to be able to make them do it. No, we can't. But I'm sorry that you can't pay your bills, but how the hell did you get a thousand dollar item? Well, so yeah. that's where yeah. I, I get. Absolutely, <clears throat> and you know, we we can all we you know we all make different choices, and we disapprove of other people's choices. That's not going to. So change. that's exactly right. You made the choice out of the iPhone rather than buy the next better piece of meat for their kids. Okay, so okay, well, um, I was like, yeah. Uh, well, this whole five-year plan, what we're talking about with this whole thing, it's mute because look at fuel prices for the working people. I mean, what's it going to be in five years? I mean, what what is it in the last month? It's on the rise. It's twenty-five cent rise in the last month. So you know, we're in a mess, right? And then you want to add a carbon tax to it? No, no carbon tax. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. no. Um, that's, that's everybody's. That's everybody's favorite. Favorite. Um, what's the word that I want? Um, moving board. <clears throat> it's not happening. There was. There. There. There is a proposal, and I. And I think it's now. Uh, well, it's definitely on hold. To. Um, to increase the. Um, the tax on. Home, uh, home delivered fuel by two cents a gallon. So my, so my two dollar and seventy nine cent 
gallon would be two dollars and eighty one cents. That's that's um, and and as and as Claude pointed out, you know, it's already gone up a quarter in the last month. So, you know, where's two cents in all of that? It's and what what that would do is it would allow us to greatly increase the number of, of homes that got weatherized because we then then we then we overall we cut down our use of fossil fuels. We make we make lower income people better able to support themselves. So you know it's but a lot of us people. I had mixed feelings about it. It's a, it's a regressive tax. It's one that hits hits everybody the same way instead of instead of having people who are better off pay more. Um, and um, the Senate the Senate is looking to find a different solution to that. So I don't know that that's going to move. We did yeah. we passed it out of the House, but I don't think it's moving. But possible. half of the time people on fuel assistance, we still got to pay two cents more a gallon for that, even though they're getting a subsidized anyway. So it blows right down to the common guy pays a lot more money. We got to do something to keep our kids here. We have uh, 16 grandchildren. Seven of them have left the state and not come back. And, and another one of my granddaughters, she leaves uh, the tent, going to Tennessee, and they're going to be moving with my two great grandchildren. They're not coming back. We need to get some our natives to stay here. Yeah, or, or or get some of the some of the college kids who are who are coming here to stay, and they do. Did I've you got a question? college kid. He's he's a senior this year at, at Champlain. He's leaving. He's not coming back. Two of, two of our four children have gone and not coming back. And they all say we can't afford to live here. I think. You know, I hate to say this, but you know, I moved here in 1978 from Connecticut. I remember my father saying, "What the hell are you going there for?" Mm -hmm. Because in the so 60s now. there was a mass exodus from Vermont. Mm -hmm. Everybody went to Connecticut to work in the, you know, the aircraft plants. He, well, he, could, he couldn't believe that I was moving to Vermont. What are you doing? So I think this is an ongoing thing that's going on. I mean, it's unfortunate it's happening. But I, I have friends who, you know, who have kids that are in their thirties and they've all left. They're not staying. And it's part of it is because they don't want to. They don't want to deal with the winter. <laughs> right. You know, right. They don't want to deal and, with. You know, and sometimes, winter, yeah. and sometimes you just want to change the scene. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I've moved around. Well, that's the reason why I left Connecticut because I didn't want to stay there. I could have, you know, what I could have, what I did up here, going, I could have done down there and made three times the money. But I came here for the way of life. Right. Uh, Mason. Uh, yes. Um, just today, coming here, uh, one issue that came up is that we're talking about uh, going ahead and making the seatbelt law a number one violation. <clears throat> so that if you're caught uh, without your seatbelt, that's going to be a ticket right away. Now we talk about the carbon tax, but we don't do anything related to, if we're talking about our saving lives, what is going on with the idling issue and making it stick? Like, if we're gonna give people tickets, mandatory for no seat belt, how about tickets? For this idly. So, going on. so in fact, in Ooh, fact, in that? fact, it is illegal. Oh, you want to? Yeah. Idly. In Not fact, idle workers. In idly fact, idly. in fact, it is illegal. <laughs> um, but it's, it's um, once again, we don't. It's not enforced. Um, <clears throat> in my, and in my in my experience, the um, some of the prime uh, um, uh, abusers of that are the state police. I once had a state police uh, state trooper. Stand, sit and talk to me for an entire hour with his motor running. Um, I did not have the courage to tell him to turn off his Well, that was probably why. <laughs> well, did you know there's an exemption for law enforcement because there's so many computers on board that instead of installing two batteries, they maintain one battery and they run the car. So, uh, yes. So, so why aren't we installing two batteries? There's so many simple solutions that our legislators are not accomplishing okay, so in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the legislation exists. Getting the getting the police to enforce it is a different thing. So so be careful where you you know we we passed that law about five years ago, over over huge pushback from all kinds of constituencies. So it has about 25 exceptions. 
Um, but I, you know, I notice that when I go to the um, to the local uh, mini mart, all the time. You know, that people, you know, people go in, you know, well, oh, well, I'm only going to be there a second, but then they run into a friend and hang out for 20 minutes. Meanwhile, the, the motor's running. Um, yes, yes, we need enforcement. Um, so some of the other things that are moving. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, what's happening with the opioid crisis? Um, we um, we've been this is this has been has had many um, approaches over the years. The the, um, the program that has been the most successful is something called Hub and Spoke, um, and there are now I think there are five or six hubs in the state. So a hub a hub is a place. Um, that is that is is actually a facility that has um, uh, medical providers who are approved to dispense methadone, um, and there's there's one in Rutland, there's one in Burlington, um, there's one in St Albans, there's one I think there's one in St Jay. So they're 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 sprinkled around the state, um, and and for people who are um, looking to um, uh, get off of heroin and fentanyl. Um, they can go to a hub and receive treatment there. They, they, they do regular urine checks on the people to make sure that they are taking the right drugs and not taking the wrong drugs. Um, and um, they get uh, counseling that goes along with the, um, with, with the methadone. It's called MAT, Medication Assisted Treatment. Um, and and another, another drug that can be used in the same way is buprenorphine which um, is, is administered either as pills or actually as a film that you put under your tongue. Um, and that can be prescribed by physicians in their offices with a special, they need a special um, license from the DEA to do that. Um, and when, when somebody is, it has stabilized at a hub, then they can be referred to a doctor. The spokes, so the spokes are doctors. So for instance, Gifford Hospital, their, um, uh, their health center now has um, doctors who prescribe buprenorphine. So someone who is, um, who is in recovery can get regular um, um, supply of drugs from them. These are people now who are, so they're working, and they're paying taxes, and they're taking care of their kids. Um, and um, so that, and we have gotten to the point with, with the rollout of all of the hubs around the state, we now have zero wait, wait list um, to get into those places. That has, been, that has been the case for, I think it's at least half a year that we've had no wait list. Um, so that's been really good news. We also have um, treatment courts sprinkled around the state. And they take various forms. I was um, I was privileged several years ago to visit the mental health court in Burlington when um, um, oh god the, um, I'm not no I'm not going to think of his name. Judge Grierson uh, was was on the bench there. He is now the chief superior judge, so he's sort of the administrator for the superior courts. But at that point, he was running um, both the um, the drug court and the uh, and the mental health court. I went on Mental Health Day um, and was allowed to sit in the. Um, there's a there's a, a meeting that precedes the um, uh, the court appearance where uh, prosecutors and defense attorneys and social workers and drug rehab people and the court administrators and the judge were probably there were there were probably 20 people at the table. Um, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement um, because everything that's there is. Is confidential because these people are are in treatment. Um, what struck me the most that day um, was that although these were people whose primary, um, well, num number one, they all had many, many, many criminal violations. They all, they were all, they all had, they had, they all had records. They had multiple pending charges. Um, that, had, that they had pleaded to. So these are people who were constantly getting in, in trouble with the law. They were, um, um, they all had um, diagnosed mental health issues, but they also were all using some kind of drugs. And, I, and I, I was struck by that because I was told that this wasn't drug court day. So, um, so, so even, so people who have mental health issues do what we call self-medicate. 
um, and so there were, it was alcohol, it was it was um, heroin, it was cocaine, all kinds of uh, all kinds of drugs that they were trying to, um, to to control. So in that process, they had regular urine urine tests um, that got reported to this to this group. So the judge sat there and listened in this in this informal group, listened to the recommendations of the treatment people uh, and the lawyers. Um, and the court people who had been working with the various clients and came up with a, with a plan for that person for that day. And then we went into the courtroom and, um, and, uh, and I was invited to sit with the judge at the bench because they don't do it, it's, it's not, it's, a, it's, an open, it's an open room, but the conference actually happens up at the, the bench so that the rest of the room doesn't hear it, again, because, because these are people who are sick and this is confidential. Um, and, and he talked to each one of the, of the um, defendants who was there that day. So these are all, in, in, in this process, these are all people who have, who have, have entered into a plea agreement. So they, 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 have a, they have been convicted of whatever the crime is. Um, and, but the condition of, of their continued um, release into the community is that they participate in this program. So, so he talked to each one of the people and if they had done everything they were supposed to do this week, um, he congratulated them and gave them some little token like a, a card for a cup of coffee or a donut um, and some of them got little pins. Uh, the, one, the couple of people had been, um, had been not compliant uh, and um, and they had some kind of sanction. Sometimes sometimes the sanction is to go spend the night in jail, um, and and the ultimate sanction is you get kicked out of the program and you go back to you have a conviction and you go back and you can you you face the um, being being sentenced on the underlying crime. Um, and I think there was one one person was in fact kicked out. That person had been given you know two or three warnings and still was not was not following the program. Um, so that was one. That was one day. On the on the alternate weeks, they had people who were in the drug the drug court. The drug court is done in, um, on the record, open session. Everybody listens. And say, they have the same. They have the same pre court meeting with all of the the, um, the workers in the court. But but when the defendants come in, they all listen to each other. So the the, the drug court is a little bit more like. Um, a little bit more like group therapy in the sense that they're listening to what's happening with, with, with others and reinforcing each other and trying to keep each other um, going forward. Um, so those were two things happening in Burlington. In, in White River Junction um, in Windsor County, they have a DUI court. Um, and there, the people um, the, who are entitled to participate in this program are people who have their third charge of driving drunk. Now think about it. These are people who are going to kill somebody. This is, this is somebody who has been, who has had one drunk driving um, conviction and paid the fine and gone through a crash and had a license suspension, has done it a second time and done all of those things, and now has done it a third time. So these are not people who are, have, have been using the rehabilitation um, tools that are already out there. So once again, this is, they, they come in, they report to the judge, they listen to each other, um, and it was, I mean, I looked around the room at these folks and I thought, oh my God, you know, these are, you know, I could, I could encounter any one of these people on a, you know, on a country road late at night and, and maybe not walk away. Um, so that, that program is, is, is working and people are getting through it and they're staying clean and they're getting back to, to their lives. Um, so, and the good news, I, this time last year, I wasn't sure that that um, that all of these treatment courts were going to continue because they are, as as I as I talked about, the number of people sitting around the table, they are in fact expensive. They're labor, they are labor intensive for the courts, for the lawyers, for for the counselors um, who are involved in, in, and even for the judge. I mean, this so the judge, the day that I was there, that was what the judge did all afternoon. Was, was go to this meeting and then sit and listen to the people in the courtroom. And there were maybe maybe 20 people on the docket that day. That was his afternoon. So um, it, it, what, what they've been able to do over the years is that the courts have gotten various grants from, um, from the federal government to keep, this, to keep the doors open on this, these programs. And this year, they were successful in getting um, a, a big grant that will keep it going for several more years. So that's, so that's another piece 
of the program. In addition, the governor um, uh, instituted an opioid coordination council. He did it by executive order a couple years ago. A woman named Jalinda LeClaire, who has had various, various jobs in, in the state and federal government over the years, is the executive director of that group. And, um, and we right now in my committee have a bill that would, that would basically um, uh, institutionalize that concept. Um, so we are trying to figure out what, it, what, does, it look, what does the council look like, um, what does the administration of it look like, where should it live, um, and, 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 and what, are, what are the realistic things that it should be doing. The, the governor's council was looking at the full range of things related to the opioid, opioid crisis from you know, treatment and, and policing and all of that. This, our bill is, um, is specifically focused on, on the issue of prevention. So, and prevention of, of all kinds of substance abuse, including tobacco. So, um, so we are we're trying to, to, to work that out um, and and get that. We have a bill that came out of the Senate. We're doing some major changes to that. We hope to vote that out this week. Um, and maybe I should stop talking and let people ask more questions. I'll start. Okay. Well, the first uh, uh, subject you talked about was Cambrook Road. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear you say anything about ANR being involved. Oh, but they are. Oh, a oh, I'm sorry, ANR. Um, uh, Let me. I'll yeah, explain. Yeah. To you. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to several meetings after Irene with the uh, these river experts <laughs> that said all the stuff that's in the river, we'll leave it there. Yeah, it's good. It won't. It'll slow down the water. There'll be no flooding. Half the reason that the bottom quarter mile, no more than half. A large part of the reason the bottom quarter mile of uh, Camp Road went so bad was trash from down the river and plug those culverts. I truly believe, I can't prove it, if the rivers or brooks have been clean, that especially the upper culvert was big enough to handle the water. So from there down to um, <coughs> Audrey Turks, good chance I wouldn't even been affected at all. The next one down, I don't think it's big enough, and especially it's on a corner. Yeah. But still, it plugged over the over the bank it goes and washed out the road. So my, I'm hoping they have another one of those. I'm going to go and ask this person, what the hell was he thinking? So, so we happened. had we had a guy in Lilliesville with a skitter and three guys ready to go to work, and they went down and said, "No, get the hell out of that brook." So one of one of the issues one of the issues is maintenance of those culverts. Um, and and the culvert was fine until the trash came down. Yeah, what it had. And they brought an excavator in, saved it a little bit because he went in there and started pulling the stuff out. I'm in Lilliesville. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened. The look, the this town line culvert plugged up with trees. And I can tell you, some of the trees came from my backyard. I had trees this big around across the brook. Monday morning when I went down to the brook, they were gone. Yeah. There was no sign of them. Nowhere. They're all down at the bottom of the, beyond that bridge, there's they're, they're down, there's a mountain of, of lumber that, that came down that brook. But it's amazing. And I, and I feel bad the fact that I, it seems like I, I, when I speak to these guys, I can't be heard because I don't have P-E-X-Y and G-R behind my name. Mm -hmm. So I don't know nothing. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm 64 years old, I've been in this town for, 60 years, I'm a tradesman, I've been out on all these roads, I've seen these things. I feel like I know some of this stuff. No, but you haven't gotten to you school haven't to learn these things. That's exactly what I said. Yeah, yeah the, the same, same thing, the sense. same thing at the time when you were a select on the select board. The state was buggy, barking at the, the town, don't take anything out of the river, the latest state. The river. Yeah? You're prohibited. That's that. right. So can you explain where is the logic over there of the state? I mean, I don't expect you to come up with an answer right now, but can you look into that? And why is the state so strict? I mean, who is overseeing these geniuses that work in those departments? And how it all started? We used to get gravel out of the river by Avery's Point. Yep. And then uh, Barry Calhoun was the engineer. If you leave a note on your piece of yeah, doing a good job. The next thing you know, you had to get a permit right. to get it. And the next thing you know, you couldn't get a permit. I said, Barry, what? What made you change your mind? 
We had an expert come in from Colorado. Yep. Tell us what we should do with our rivers. I think that expert ought to go back to Colorado. No, that's not our But it was paid for by the... That's right here now. Yeah, it was paid for by Trout Unlimited, the Salmon people, and, and uh, another agency in Vermont. So, stack back. Can we? Yeah. These are, the professional, and these are the professional demonstrators or protesters. That's right. Yeah. You know. Nobody objects to taking things out of the river as long as you're not speeding it up. Most of the things that get taken out of the river, most of the work that's done in the river that removes material, whether it's the 1% of the material that's wood, the trees, or the 98% of the material, which is stone, gravel, rocks, when you take that stuff out and speed the river up, you're only moving the problem somewhere else. Well, that's it's up for a big debate. You know, we've been living here for 40 down. some years. I don't know how long you've been here, Dave. And when the gravel was being removed from the from the river, there was never a problem. All of a sudden, the problem is being developed because. The experts are telling us, live it like this. The nature will take its course and destroy you, you know. I mean, that's how we look at it. And that's how we see it and how we, that's how we live it. I was out of, I couldn't come out anywhere for two days out of my house. Either way it was, and I was wondering, what if an emergency vehicle has to come? I was told by another expert that, oh, well, they send an ADV to get you or your wife. Wonderful, yeah. I recommend everybody take five or 10 minutes at the Tunbridge Fair this year and visit the, what's called the water table. They have this little model of what happens in a, in a stream when you put things in and take things out and speak, put more water in. It's, it's an instant tutorial on, on hydraulics. And it clears a lot of things up. The trees that block the stream are not going to be a problem. Did, did that exhibit get washed out? Oh, did that exhibit get washed out? What are you talking about? No. You slow no. the river. You slow the river down. You're only doing the right thing. Whenever you slow it down, whenever you speed it up, you do the wrong thing. It's not the, the amount of water that creates the damage. It's the force with which it strikes the banks. Well, that brings into the fact that in this last 40 years, as you're speaking, hey, we are experiencing more water drop. You know, you can, you can question the science about climate change, but this is a piece of the puzzle. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that on the uh, House floor, like you did for the Bethel issue just now, you should get up and make sure that Phil Scott has an electric vehicle. Why? Because it's educational. <laughs> you know, we have, you gotta slow down the water <laughs> and we're not doing it. And the legislation needs to do a lot more small direct actions to make this start working. Taking out the gravel, <laughs> Dave's right. As, at, as part of the problem, the water volume increases and if we're getting more rain, that is one powerful wall of water coming down. I live higher up on a mountain, and my problem is I'm trying to stop a road from being built, which is totally insane at this moment, to even think about allowing a road to be built with that much slope degree and that much water. And I'm not getting any help from any legislators, by the way. And it's been two and a half years of fighting to prevent this from happening, which, if it happens, will most likely flood my house. So in the um, in the town of Ripton, um, after Irene, one of the things that they did was they found a way to create a new floodplain that was behind the village. I don't know how many of you go over 125, but but Ripton is a little bit in a, in a way it's, it it's, it reminds me a little of Bethel in the sense that it's that it's that it's that, that, narrow, the, the, it, it's yeah it's it's narrow it's and and it's windy through the village. Um, but what they did was they found a way to get the water to go behind the village, up, 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 upstream. They created um, a, a runoff for water so that it didn't then um, uh, take out the houses that were in the village. Um, so there, 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 are other, there are other solutions to 
um, to you know where you where you direct the water. Um, I came over Camp Brook. I <coughs> probably shouldn't have. I ignored the road close signs um, the couple of days after the rains, and um, and what I saw uh, up at the top was that um, the, the cracks that I described along the sides were there, um, but the 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 brooks that were coming down off the hill were scouring under the pavement. Yeah. So, so, so a lot of the damage was um, what, is, what we call it fluvial erosion, I think. Where so, so the waters, the waters coming in and it hits something and it just scours and it just keeps scouring and and so it, it takes away the um, the underlayment of the pave, of the road and then and then because it's already been weakened by heavy loads, it just breaks and that's there. You know that's that's the damage at the top. I, I will I'll give you that, but I'll, I'm I'm just. I'm not saying that taking the trees out is going to fix everything. Two culverts near the bottom. There was no wood in the river. Those cul the biggest culvert would have taken. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the other one because it is on a corner and that's a tough, mm -hmm. that's a tough thing no matter what. But the other culvert, the water comes, hits it straight. Mm -hmm. There'd been no nothing to block that culvert. I truly believe the water would have gone through there. From there to Audrey Turks would have been fine. Uh, as far as the breakdown of the roads, <laughs> that's known as building the road correctly. I don't know if you remember, but I do, because I went to some of those meetings after Irene, and the contractor, which was, by the way, a little bitter, who rebuilt that road, told the town, we're going to close this road. We have, you have so much clay on those slopes. We actually have to put some matting in to try to control it, which they did, but it wasn't enough. I mean... I don't know what matting is. Well, it's a, it's a, like a plastic composite okay. that you put in to try to keep the, the soil it makes it the truck out of the road. Yeah, and it just wasn't enough. We have a culvert. Um, it's actually Morse Road, but it's up by me that uh, washed out in my range. They went and put a lot of different sizes of granite mm -hmm. in and around in the head wall. It got all white because it washed the gravel off the top, but it was dryable. It's there. No work needed. We can't. We don't spend enough money on the road. It just drove. It's been driving me nuts for years. You got a hundred thousand dollars work on the road, so you do them all a little bit instead of okay. I'll take a hundred thousand dollars to do this mile. Let's do it right. Do we it did once. Uh, do it once. Do it on the Rochester side many years ago. I want to say twenty. Uh, they actually they had there was a place um, on on Bethel Mountain Road um, after the after the T coming towards Bethel that was constantly being damaged and they they rebuilt it with a rubber bladder um, so they put a they put a, a, a rubber and it was very expensive we we had you know lots of debate about about it but it's it's held up and it's been years now so yes you're right doing doing it right is of course it doesn't have the traffic from my road to my sugar house. I grabbed it every three years. I'm going to put that down. It cost me a lot of money that year. 15 years ago, I just keep driving over. Nothing. I don't have to buy more gravel. I don't have to degrade. I don't have to do anything. Keeps the it right finally. <laughs> Keeps the material from mixing. Make the fabric makes it like a truss on the whole thing. So, yeah, it's great stuff. Anyway, I know we don't have any money. But the biggest problem is most of these roads, they're made for a horse and buggy. Well, they'll make them a little wider and they'll put some gravel to them. Be to the sub base isn't good, and you just put another band-aid on top of it. So, and the most important thing with the road is drainage. You right. gotta keep the water out of the road. They make an island out of it, and then it'll work, so. But before I forget, I wanna compliment you for taking this moment. I would yell at the others if I think <laughs> um, I, I, I will let them know that. <laughs> you know, you're talking about the, the weight on the roads. What do you suppose the town trucks weigh with all their plows, sand it, and a load of sand? So if you're going to cut this restriction back, how are you going to go on it with the 10 wheelers? Good question. They shouldn't be able to go any better than what I can. The 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 road road right to start with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anyone notice, notice the huge, huge top pile of granite that's being built up next to the interstate mm -hmm. from Quarry? Mm -hmm. Yes, I just saw that the other day. And uh, they're running out of space 
to put this excess stone. Around the spoil? Mm -hmm. Spoil, it's stuff that they have to no, take out to get the good stuff? It's not of the size and quality that yeah, one that's right. Right. It's called yeah. crowd. And, um, they, they, they stockpile it uh, until the state needs a lot of it, and, and, and it's worth bringing in a crusher, and they crush it and spread it. Well, the that's what, it, it, that's, I don't think that's happened more than once. It happened for Irene. Right. So Irene. The yeah. problem in this town is that the, the, uh, one of the uh, committees, I don't even know which one, passed a uh, ordinance or whatever they want to call it to, uh, to can't crush that stuff. You can't, you can't make it that's, that's feasible fine. because they put a limitation on three trucks an hour going in and out. Well, whoever's running the crusher ain't gonna, Not gonna work. Ain't gonna have three trucks an hour going in and out. You yeah, gotta, but when there's an emergency, like when we had those those uh, those minor <coughs> trucks on the road that shouldn't be on any state road during the emergency, moving uh, all that all that rock around that we needed to move fast in an emergency, all those rules uh, get uh, uh, well, temporarily waived. It's too bad that we couldn't have had something waived. Uh, so that there was 10,000 yards of crushed granite up on Christian Hill, so that when, because I know this this town was scrambling trying to find something for material. I mean, they were hauling it, they were buying it from Pike from Mount Barry, where, wherever it could be found. And we had it right in this town. That's a right. Huge resource that other people would come and buy. Actually, <sighs> There was a time when Rock of Ages was given us that stuff. Yeah. We didn't pay for it. The, mm -hmm. the rip wrap we still get. Yeah. And uh, I don't know why we just don't work with Rock of Ages to use that material to straighten some of these roads up. The, the basic problem with the Vermont roads, as I see it, since I've been in the 60s, um, they weren't built to begin with. Whoever yeah. said they were built for hot is absolutely right. The roads are, they're not going to. Camp work is a perfect example. When I went up first one on the select board, we'd already contracted to rebuild um, Camp Work Road, and it was a big hoopla about how big it was. And I happen to know the contractors from up there, and um, I, I knew them well enough so you could sit and have a deal with them. And he said, This food all last. The specs are such that this road isn't going to last. And we had a big to do about uh, the grand opening of the new camp or road and how it was going to last for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. well, it was a very brief lifetime. Whose lifetime? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a lifetime of the road. But it just wasn't built right, and then you, whoever said it is correct. You throw a band aid on it, make it look pretty, put in some new guardrails, paint it, and it's good for about 18, 24 months. You just have to see the cracks come back, and that's a Get you away, but something out of there is going well, wrong. And they need to be like camp work. Uh, give the damn road to the state, and they could take care of us. Uh, that's an idea. Well, how long have we been trying, and you've been trying, the select board, to the state to take over the camp Rook road? Forever. Except it's, it's, still a road. it's still a road, and who's going to pay for it? It's the, yeah, we're still going to end up paying still going to end up one way or another. Well, and the state would just put a Band-Aid on it, too. They don't fix stuff. But then, so. The state keeps raising the specifications for what the road has to look like before they'll take it. You know, if you drive out uh, on 107 uh, in any direction at all, or up on 12, wherever, they, wherever the state has come in and made improvements and, and brought the, that section of road up to spec, you know, there's this it's not just the pavement which is improved, it's the right of way which is wider and the guardrails which are different and everything is different. <clears throat> it's making it harder and harder for towns to get the state to take some roadway on to their own because you have to bring it up to spec before they'll take it. Isn't and Camp Brook a federal road? Mm -hmm. um, it, gets, it does get federal highway assistance okay. because it connects two highways. Okay. But, um, yeah, it's, so it's in, a, it's in a kind of special category, but it's definitely town roads on both sides. Okay. Well, it is special because I believe that that repair, if it's done within an X amount of time, it will be, be no uh, no money out of Bethel or Rochester on yeah, that that's, that's my understanding. You have to do it within 180 days, right? 
Where is this? Sharon. Sharon. Two weeks. That, they bring a big one in. That's everywhere in the state? I mean, There's regulations everywhere. The high on the hill, you know, um, they had problems crushing, and they could only crush a certain period of time. And they finally went back and they could get a longer permit. But you can't meet their specs. You can't I know it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, times when we had uh, had to get get crushed on and the rock of ages was willing to give it to us. It created all kinds of havoc with neighbors that were yeah. dust on their hay for their horses and um, I think it's I not my backyard. I can't even no. think of I think it's more the dust or more the noise. What's that? You think it's more the dust or more the noise that control. Control. We're way back on a mountain, nothing around us. It's a form of control. Act 250 is. It's taken me three years to renew my Act 250 permit on Tory and forty thousand dollars. And here on the other hand, we are, we're spending ten thousand dollars to bring new people in the state mm -hmm. with no guarantees they're going to stay here. Once they see rules like that, fuel tax uh, taxes, uh, higher wages. For who the farmers already are bitching and complaining, they are not going to be able to make ends meet. But the state is always doing for the right thing. You know, we got to do the right thing. More money for everybody. Either you you're good for it or not. You stand there like a dummy and you get fifteen dollars an hour. I mean, I was in business forty some years, and I'm sure you have the same thing trying to find people. Um, So what, what's your response to that? I mean, uh, uh, not yours, but the state's like uh, $10,000 to bring oh, people oh, in. Oh, the $10,000. Um, so I have real mixed feelings about that, but the governor loves it. Um, Got a lot the, of press. The, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, so, so number one, let's let's be clear about, about what the money is. It's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a check. Uh, it's reimbursement for certain kinds of expenses, like like getting broadband, which we're still trying to get around the state. Um, and so it, it's and it's it's up to five thousand dollars a year. So I don't know I don't know that anyone has gotten that. Um, and it is the intention is to bring in people who have high tech jobs make good money and will pay taxes here. That's the concept. They've gotten, my understanding is that it has in fact um, produced a lot of um, interest in people thinking about, and young people, we're looking for young families. That's, that's, that's the demographic that the governor has identified as, as, as being um, underrepresented in Vermont right now. That we have, we, we have, there are lots of us who have um, gray or graying hair, um, and and not so not so many not not so many kids. Um, and 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 yes, it is true that some of the kids leave. I have to say, you know, if I if if I anywhere that I grew up, I would want to live somewhere else for a while. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, you know, I, I moved. I moved here from San Francisco. So, so um, you know, people people at a certain age want to have different life experiences, and that's one of the reasons that they go somewhere else. Um, people come here because, in fact, they like to live here, and and that's and so what what the governor's program has done is it has, in fact, in, increased interest in the state. Um, it, uh, it's sounds like a lot of money. In fact. I believe that the, I, I don't have the clear number in my head, but it's something like it would be a total of 50 people if everybody got everything they were supposed to get. That's the budgeted amount. So it's not, it's not a lot of people who are actually going to get any money, but it's been used to promote the state. Don't you, think, you, think, don't you think if taxes cheap. were cut down? If what? If what? If cut some taxes down that you're adding every year, you add more and more and more, wouldn't people Sorry. bring more people in? Hey, look. The taxes are low. The real estate taxes are low. I mean, no matter where you turn around, you know, you don't know if you're going to be dead or alive next year when you have to pay all these taxes. So, all I can tell you is that every study that I've heard about, taxes are are the are not even on the list of the things that people give as the reasons that they 
come here or leave here. It has to do with family, it has to do with weather, it has to do with job opportunities. Um, housing is actually a big issue right now. I, I would say I would say the biggest hurdle that we have in the state right now is is available affordable, affordable housing. Affordable, affordable housing. housing. Well, but even available. I mean, there aren't that many things. Big line senior housing. Yes, really. yes. At, at every level, we have a problem. We have we have we have a problem. That's that's what I'm hearing about, and, and that's true. Now, I just read an article this weekend. It's true even in Burlington. You know, we think of Burlington as oh well, they don't have anything to worry about. They have good jobs and lots of people and lots of money. But in fact, the um, you know workers in their 30s are saying. I can't find a place I can afford to, to, to live. I mean, it's great to make, you know, it's great to make, um, you know, fifty thousand dollars a year. But if you have to spend thirty of it on rent, you're not getting anywhere. So, um, you know, we have to figure out how, you know, how to how to make how to how to make housing more available and more affordable. Well, then yeah. this is what the, the you always hear for the last 20, 30 years. The state has to figure out how to do it. How long does it take to figure problems like, like Well, this what I can tell you is that, so I've sat, I have been on the Rochester Planning Commission since 1982. Um, and one of the things that we did very, very soon after I came on the board was we changed the zoning um, to increase the density in the village so that, so the people with big old houses could cut them into apartments. Um, and it doesn't happen. And, and we, have a, we, have, we have zones where we say, you can have a business here. If nobody wants to do it, you know, you know, like, how, how do I go out and recruit some and say, oh, here's here's a nice piece of land, you know, why don't you why don't you do a business? Well, you know, you're you're retired, so you don't want to do a business. So, you know, there's there's a limit to what government can do. We can make we can make things possible, but it's business that has to make things happen, and the same is true with housing. Well, here's a business right there that he's telling you he's taking three years to get a permit for his. Uh, gravel uh, renewal, renewal, renewal. renewal. Thirty-two I mean, here, years. Here's the prime example right there. If the state is putting the thumb down, no, you can't do it. You have to do it this way. You have to do it this way. Do you think these people are going to be stupid enough to come here and say, "Oh, this is a beautiful place to live. I can't make it though." Think of these things as before. Whatever you said is fine, but how is that going to work? I know people are left the state and are still living, and I can name them. My son is number one for the very same reasons. Another one, Cecil Washburn, he is looking at getting out of the state. Uh, Paul Slot years ago went to tennis. You know, just I can make anything over here. Since the taxes are so high, when you hear what the real estate taxes are in other states compared to here, it makes your hair stand out. Could it be that those other states are more populated? That there's more of a tax base. But here's again, not if Montana. Not Montana. Not well, there's the first stuff that is Montana, though. They need that. You're not even close. Like the taxes up here are minuscule. It's not a burden. But there's no service. Yeah, they're looking for eight years. So. Well, so there's another there's prime, main prime reason. example uh, in Massachusetts. My son says, well, it costs a little more to live there, but I get a lot more. Like what? He says, trust removal is free. The, they, the, the county or the, or the town takes care of it. That's number one. And besides have many other things. So, but here we have to tax everything. We have to force things to make the state livable and nice and green, which you all know it's green. Uh, and we all love to live here, but for how long, I don't know. Tell me the name of your quarry. Quimby Mountain Stone. I'm sorry? Quimby Mountain Stone. You steam drills? Steam drills? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you remove the material? Oh, drill and blast. What kind of drill? I, we sub it out, so. Subcontract comes in twice a year. Is, is, he, is he using steam? It's a, it's a mica schist. It's actually made for stone walls and fireplaces. And they just bought a wet saw for stone veneer. It's a 42-inch blade that runs in water. Put a stone on it, and it goes down through, cuts the backside off, the background, turn it over, cuts the other backside off. And 90% of that stuff goes to Pennsylvania. Now, Act 250 was a, is, is, a, is, a, is a, indeed a great thing. Yeah. So it, it, it took me, it was 11 agencies that we had to go through. But the your agency, business, that particular business, 
Everybody in this room goes by it once a week, yeah. at least once a week. And 90% 90 of you don't know where it is. Because you can't see it. You don't even know how to get there until you figure it out. That's right. You're not making any more dust, dust and my cat doesn't. It's cat blood. And you, you, it's, it's just a clean, clean yeah. operation. Yeah. We, we have uh, three acres down between the interstate and the railroad track. And the new owners wanted to put they bought it, but no money's changed hands yet. We're still waiting for this crap. It was 2.9 acres down there. So they're talking about putting a building out down there. Well, they call that prime ag soil, okay? So we had a guy come down from the state, made his 20 minute speech, about you'll have to buy six acres somewhere else and set it aside. And I said, now let's just think about this thing a little bit. There's a 50-foot right-of-way all down the side of it, turns, goes up through the box culvert. The other side of that is a fork. The other side of that's a swamp. You might be talking an acre, an acre, a quarter, and actually it's grass ground. Mike Chase has two head of cattle. It's seven acres over here, and then he fences that little acre up. Two head of cattle. You have, that might support one cow in the summer, but it gives you nothing in the wintertime. So what's more important, if you have a building here, it gets some tax income for the town, makes employment, or is that one cow more important? Well, we'll take that into consideration. But, I've yeah. never That's seen anything there except a, a couple of family beef. Yeah, so I have. They, they, no, they don't grow a crop there. Oh, they can't. It's not hay. No. There's nothing else to no. it, The animals mm -hmm. eat the trees. No, any, any, he'll get them full on and he butchers them in the fall. That's prime ag? That's prime ag sauce. Yeah. No. It's a lack of common sense. Oh, none. Zero. Yeah. Zero. What is that, uh, brother? What's yeah. common sense? I'd like to back up uh, to something Mason said earlier about uh, getting the governor into an electric car. That's a great idea. But again, I think I mentioned on my last time here on my way out the door that all this electrical, electric cars and stuff is still putting the cart on the horse. We have still got a lot of work to do in permitting and designing and coming up with correct alternate source of energy. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of work that we have to do before we put everybody in an electric car. Well, that's just because the idea. you're not going to save any money. You're going to still be buying your electric from either a Hydro Quebec, which probably not, or out of uh, out of the mid. Midwest, they have all the coal and whatever, fossil fuel uh, or wood burning or whatever. There are other ways that just don't get the attention or whatever they need to, to be brought online. I mean, a, I know it's not ANR, but whoever says do not put a dam in the river, <laughs> that's probably the best source of electric power we have. The rivers, the rivers in this in this state it is probably the best source, and they're gone. They're gone. Also, we're gone. Sorry. And Mr. Durfee's is still going. Uh, the big one on the, the Connecticut River is going, but I and there's a one up in Waterbury. But I mean, they're you can count on one hand. You've been up the Connecticut River. There's a lot of dams on you know, on the tributaries. I didn't. We, my wife wants a 251, but. So you can't imagine the amount of dams up there. Plus, they hold the water back. You don't have the ice flows either as much as you used to have. Still got the big moor dam up. But yeah. No. But this this is on the small tributaries that come oh, into it, you know, that, that feed the Connecticut. But then, anyway, and maybe maybe it's solar, and maybe it's wind. But before everybody is driving an electric car, we got to have a good mm -hmm. source of alternate energy. Well, David, I think the other thing too is what's going to happen with these batteries and these cars. Well, when they are no longer usable, I know that everybody figured, everybody figured that out. You know, lithium ion. What? What are they? You know, what, what well, now there's lithium cobalt. Yeah. There's all kinds of new stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just like the, I just had a guy come to my house wants to put wants me to buy a solar panel put on the roof of my house. <laughs> okay, so because I've had it around it long enough, he says, "What are you going to do with the solar panels when they're done?" Oh, we'll take them on. What are you going to do with the hazardous waste that's in them? Oh, mm -hmm. we don't know. There's no hazardous waste in the solar panels. No more than there is in your TV. 
Mm -hmm. I will get into that conversation with you, sir. That's yes, something I might know more, a little, a little more about. So, and one more final question, at least from my side. Who oversees all these government agencies? Who, who do they respond to Me. when they come up with these beautiful ideas to keep the planet green and the state green and well, whatever? I mean, you pass every the law. The, go the governor, every, every agency <coughs> is within the administration and is therefore overseen by the gover governor. So the governor is responsible to oversee all these agencies? All, all the governor is in charge of administration of the state. Okay, that's an answer to my question. Maybe you can get him down here next time. Uh, that doesn't work. It just like we don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, he's, he's we have to have something drastic happen, probably, then to bring him down here. I mean, it makes me wonder who makes these rules. I mean, you, you, every attention, good attention you have to pass in these new laws and everything, but how they are enforced is the big question. So, so there, so, okay, so there are, there are laws that are passed by the legislature and, and signed by the governor. If the governor doesn't sign yeah. it, it doesn't become a law. There are rules that are done by, by individual agencies under their, within, so, so we might pass a law that says, you know, um, here's here's the policy. Um, you guys make a rule that that um, that allows to, that, that puts the policy in place. So those are done at the agency level, uh, and they go through a process where they uh, they you know they have they have public hearings on them. The what we call stakeholders weigh in. So you know the, if if it regulates a certain kind of business. Business representatives are there. Uh, there are advocates for, let's say, um, you know, if it's something that affects elders, there would AARP would be consulted. All of those folks, okay. Um, and then, and then they come up with a draft rule that then is sent to all of the other government agencies to review. So, okay, well, how does this affect transportation? Well, the transportation people get to look at it. Um, and after it got it, so that I'm going to call that kind of an in-house review or in, in government review. Then it comes to a committee of the legislature called the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. They meet every two weeks all year long, um, and they get these packages of rules and they look at them to see whether whether they whether they satisfy legislative intent, whether they whether they're overreaching, um, arbitrary in some way. Um, and um, so the, the committee chairs, if a, if, a, if a bill, if something had come out of our committee, my committee chair would go through it and, and, and give her comments. Uh, again, all, all the same players I was talking about, business and advocates and all of those folks can be in the room. They, they will send notes to the committee. And, and this committee then says that it, that it does or doesn't meet legislative intent. And after that review, then it, can, it takes effect. Um, the legislative committee cannot stop it from going into effect, but what it does is it shifts the burden of proof if there's ever a challenge. So, for instance, if 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 the, if the legislative committee says it's fine, then it's then it's then it's solid and it's a rule that can be implemented. If the legislative committee says no, it still gets <coughs> implemented. But then, if I come, if if a, if a citizen comes forward and says, you know, this this is arbitrary. The, the, it's the burden is then on the administration to show that it's not, as opposed to the reverse. Um, so that's so that's that. We do have, um, you know, you talked, you asked about oversight earlier. We do have certain things um, where there are committees that that get the government to come and report. For instance, I sit on something called Justice Oversight that meets in the off, off session. Um, it used to be called Corrections Oversight. It was it was actually born. Years ago, when there were some, um, I think, suicides in the, in the prisons, um, I want to say 15 years ago, um, and and so the legislature said, oh, we, we need to keep an eye on this. So they they set up a committee that meets about once a month in the off session, um, and 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 the corrections people come and tell us what's going on. Um, we have expanded it. It's now called justice oversight because it now includes some things that relate to juvenile justice. Um, but that's those. There, there aren't many of those. There are there are oversight committees for things like health care reform. Um, but um, and in our regular, you know, in our day to day work, when we are in session, we do in fact have 
um, uh, government people come in and tell us what's going on. You know, for instance, I talked. You know, I took, uh, I'm not sure you were here when I was talking about about all the things that we've been doing um, on the opioid opioid crisis. We get reports about that. So, you know, the, the commissioner of health comes in and says, "Okay, these are the things that we have in place. This is this is where we're going next. This is where we need. This is this is a piece that needs new legislation because we don't have the power to do what we want to do here. Those kinds of things. So, the, so we're looking at, you know, where where. Where, where do we need a new law? And I, I will tell you that very honestly, I, I, resist, I resist the, the knee-jerk, there ought to be a law. Um, I, need to be convi- I need to be convinced that we need a new law. And, and when anybody presents a bill on the floor of the House, the first question they answer is, what's the problem? You gotta, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Because if there's no problem, we don't, you know, we, we, don't, we, don't, need another, we don't need another law. Um, and so, and so, a lot of us are very, um, are, you know, are cautious about that, um, and that's why when I talked about the, you know, the, 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 the amendment that I brought last week, it was, you know, it, it didn't work. So, you know, we, we, we recognize the problem, but that's not the right solution. So we're going to keep we're going to keep plugging at it. Well, I understand what you just said, but it seems to me that the powers that be are very few hands that have something to do with it, and the general population is being ignored. That's, so That's why we're all here this morning, I think. Yeah, well, it's the same number every time, you know, so, um, I mean, the thing that I, it bugs the hell out of me is when you're talking about bringing new people in, in the state and you let others go because they can't live here, they can't afford to pay the taxes and no. all. These are the problems we have to answer instead of the opioid. Years ago, the then police chief of uh, Burlington named Scully, he would deny there were problems of drugs in his city. Deny, 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 and all of a sudden, boom, exploded. It's all over the place now. So. Look at the things that are important right now instead of just, oh, we don't have any problem with this right now. You know, let it go a little worse and then maybe we'll deal with it. You know. The problem with the, the rivers and everything. Who's going to convince these experts to let the towns and private people clean up the rivers before it gets any worse? These are the questions that are in the minds of a lot of people all the time. Can you bring some answers, or can the legislature have some answers about it? We do this to protect you. Protect me from what? From being killed by the rivers, or what? I, I don't know. It's, I know it's a hard question to answer, and I'm not expecting an answer just like that, but. All I can tell you is that that conversation goes on all the time. There are there are different points of view about True. about about the way that it's appropriate to work in rivers. Yeah. And 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 you know you may not like the you know the experts on one side, but they but there are there are people who have good solid science behind some of the things the positions that they take. That's all I can tell you. On your tax bill, on your real estate tax. What percent of that goes to education? Oh God, it's uh, looks probably two thirds. Probably two thirds. That's where you need to address things, right there. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I I personally believe in public education, and that's what we're doing. I do too, but I don't think it should cost what it's costing right now. It shouldn't cost eighteen thousand dollars per student. That's a lot of money. What are you getting out of it? Are these kids really qualified and they come out here in the real world? I don't think so. You can't even read cursive writing even. <laughs> it's a joke, isn't it? No, it's not a joke. No, it, I, I, it's I, not a joke. I, I, I worked with someone um, who could not write me a note. Yeah. Um, because everybody does everything on, you know, on keyboards now. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to write anything. I was, I was appalled. I have, although I have to tell you that from taking notes all these years, my handwriting has totally deteriorated. Mm-hmm. So it happens. Doesn't get better with age, does it? <laughs> like so many things. Because you can't see it. One thing. Like so many things. But no, that we want our kids to stay here. 
but they can't afford to stay here. If I wasn't 77 years old and love it where I am, I've been here my whole life, I'd move too, but I'm too old to move. So I'll just bite the bullet and pay the taxes. So. But it isn't because I like to. If you didn't have that portion of your school tax, I think I'd probably pay for my kids' education. And then you could afford to live here. You, you've got to support your town, you've got to support the roads and all this stuff. But 80% of my taxes goes to school. And if yeah. you didn't have that burden, we'd all be better off. Well, I, you know, here in Bethel, you know, we did the consolidation thing. Yeah. Our taxes went up. Yeah, I was didn't work. Our school taxes went up. So, yeah. um, what's going on? <laughs> so, I believe I told you before, I did not support Act 46. Okay. In fact, I bought it to you now. Um, I, I never quite got it. Um, my, my cynical view is that it was a way to um, reduce the number of meetings that superintendents had to go to, and superintendents have a very large voice in that building. Um, there was, it was, it, sadly, um, the, initial, the initial impetus was, in fact, um, people complaining about, about school taxes. And, and so um, some of my colleagues said, oh, we have to do something. So we did mm -hmm. something. And, and it you does wrong. Happen. We did something. Yeah. And it, and it, well, you know, that unfortunately that does happen. Um, and and, that's, and that's, that's the reality of politics is once you've gone down, once you've started down a certain road, and I promised you, I'm going to do something about this, then I can't back off and say, well, you know what? really awfully complicated and we can't figure it out because that is in fact the case about a lot of things that we look at like like how do, how do we how do we make more housing well well we, we have the, we have we have the land uh, we have some fun we have some financing in place we have agencies that, that do it but you know if nobody comes forward and says I'm going to be the the clerk of the works to make this happen it doesn't happen so you know there's there there is a limit to what government can do and and every time we get into one of these things one of my uh, one of my colleagues had a sign on her wall that said it's more complicated than it looks in her committee room and that is true of just about everything you that we get pick up <laughs> Well, well, this is the scary thing when you're talking about housing. Nobody's coming forward to do it because they are scared of the regulations and the things that the government is demanding. Well, exactly. That. I you know, agree with him on that. You know, yeah. I'm a landlord. Mm -hmm. My tenants have more rights than I do. Yep. Exactly right. Yeah. And on top of that, they get a rebate at the end of the year from the rent they are paying. And they get money from the state to pay the rent. Right. These are the things that boils people. I can and see. Yeah, I can see making something, you know, so that people aren't there. I mean, there are unscrupulous landlords out there that that, True. Are, that are that are slumlords. You know, they just don't take care of the properties. I understand that, but you know, it's it's so hard because you can't, the regulations are just ridiculous mm -hmm. as to what you have to go through, mm -hmm. you know, to try to get a tenant out. It's, it's, to try to get them out. Try to get yeah. them out. I have friends and in Burlington that pay people 10, uh, you know, here, here's $1,500, get out. Yes, mm -hmm. I have heard, I have heard that. It's if you, cheaper. If you go through an entire eviction process, yep. like in Vermont, yep. you're looking at pretty close to 10 grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Ten thousand dollars to get somebody out of a seventy-five, uh, seven hundred fifty-dollar a month apartment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it's pretty cheaper. And it's and cheaper that, the mind. evictions, are, at least any evictions I've had, have, have always been due to the fact they haven't paid their rent. That's so you've already, you've already lost, you're lost, right? you're already lost yeah. four or five months rent, right. and, and that it, cost you another ten. And grand the minute, and the minute you serve, you never see another cent. That's right. crazy. Then you, then you go to the bank and fix place up after they get out of it. That's right. Because right. yeah. they trash it. But they don't care. Yeah. So that's one answer, major answer to the housing problem we have. Mm -hmm. Fix that first, and then try to get some, OK, you have to have this, you have to have you, you start with the, from the bottom, the people get on their welfare check. And I asked years ago, why don't you send it to me for the rent? Oh, we can't do that. That's their, their money. Mm -hmm. OK? The education budget. About a third of it goes to the school building and heating it and uh, no. administration. Another third goes just for the health insurance for teachers. 
What about salaries, teacher salaries? Uh, just the health insurance, not the salaries. The health insurance for the teachers is a third of the education budget. Yeah, I don't think it's that. Much. It's 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 but 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 the but the the I believe the number is 80% of school cost is personnel, which would include health insurance. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, we're paying for people. We're paying, we're paying for people who work with children. That's, that's what, that's where the cost is. Say, what are you seeing for a driven? Um, um, I have my, if, if I had to put money on it, I would say May, May 18th. May 18th. It's a Saturday. So three, three weeks. You're pretty successful at um, He would say no. I the I, governor, I, the I, governor's going to throw a monkey wrench in again this year. I'm no, I'm not sure about a, that. A reason whether we want to meet again in May or not. And uh, that's one that's oh, the question okay. before we uh, yeah. this part. This when do you have to decide? Let me know. When, 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 which, which day did you have it? Because somewhere in there we have Memorial Day. So what, somewhere in May is Memorial Day. What day did you have it picked? I, I had picked 520. Okay. Because the next weekend is Memorial Day. So um, uh, okay, so that that's a question, that's a question mark because um, so if if we don't if I'm wrong. Uh, about the 18th, we might be working that day. So um, uh, I don't know if we can make a candidate, but right. I mean, I, I, I can't do this and go up there course not. in the same day. Well, I'm going to tentatively schedule a meeting for 520. Okay. And, okay. Uh, we'll and, we'll, and we'll, stay, we'll stay in touch. I have your email. If I don't so. give David any money, uh, they'll show up. <laughs> give me a week. Let me know a week ahead of time whether we're doing it or not. Put it in the paper. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to know a week ahead. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, until last week. Well, give me as much notice as you possibly can. Okay. It's okay. always okay. unclear. Well, well so, yeah, you, you know what? Yes. It's what happens is. Maybe so, it would be a nice so, day you can meet on the wall. So here's, <laughs> so here's, so here's the deal. Um, uh, we can't leave okay. until we have budget. And um, and so um, and right now the budget is still in committee in the Senate. Um, uh, they told me that they think they're going to vote it out this week, so by Friday. Um, then it has to go to the floor of the Senate, um, which will take at least two or three days, legislative days, and and then it goes to conference. When I first started in the legislature, I was told that the rule of thumb was that we would adjourn two weeks after the budget went to conference, which means that we're running late. Um, but I also know, but we now have um, the chair of the House Appropriations Committee and the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee are sisters, and they commute together. So it's possible that things will happen more quickly. From where? <laughs> uh, Daniel. From where? Danville. Oh, Danville. Well, they got plenty of time to commiserate. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> Danville. <laughs> so, uh, so I, um, okay. our, 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 we are budgeted for 18 weeks, and May 18 is the end of that. So that's another. That's that's a huge pressure. To get out of there. I got here a little bit late today, but I got a question. Where's our when's our county senate seat holders today? They are they are at other meetings in other places, all all three of them. This happens, that happens. A actually from the legislative side we've had better support this year than we've had practically in any year. I mean uh, you, you watch Alice drive uh, from Love over the snowstorm. Yeah, um, really. You know, I think we've done very well. <laughs> they, 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 we have not had public attendance the way I would like to have them. But we do get an article. <laughs> I, I got to look at that um, because uh, this is being funded by the American Legion, and uh, the American Legion dues cannot be used for something like this. The, the, the dues to the American Legion in Bethel all go to the feds, the state and feds. We, oh. we retain none of our dues here in town. So we have to have fundraisers of sorts. Oh. Uh, and there are a whole lot of um, people who want to stand out in the sun and uh, be 
coin drop or that sort of thing. And we try also uh, to send kids to boys and girls state. Oh, good. Which is, uh, I have not got fixed yet because uh, that depends on the guidance council the new, the new uh, during high school. But that's a great, great program for young people. Kurt, do you think the BRI could step in? And we have to ask. We have to ask. Or we can check to see if the BRI can mm -hmm. step in and help subsidize, keep this thing going forward. What, what, why did you wait this long? To why did we wait? Well, wait? Because you just brought it up? No. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing I was going to say, a small thing in the news.